as I said, we are really, really excited to have Megan here. Um, she's going, I personally, I follow her work, like I've been following her, I follow her tweets and everything. If you're not, if you're on Twitter and if you're not following Megan, you should follow her on Twitter or Hang on, Prathy, you've been muted. <laughs> if you could unmute. <laughs> I've been muted. Oh, I'm sure it was you, James. It definitely wasn't me, but you, um, you have got quite a lot of <laughs> feedback, uh, some buzzing going on on your mic. Um, oh, is it? Uh, but okay, that's I, all right. We'll, it, we'll see if yeah, we can we'll, fix that for later. All right. Um, so, yeah. Um, so yeah, Megan is an MVP and she does amazing data visualization stuff. So I, before, yeah, without me wasting any more time, today Megan is going to talk about a practical application of storytelling techniques in Power BI. I am excited for the session and over to you, Megan. Thank you. Let me get my screen shared. There we go. Can we see my title slide? Yes. Yep. Sorry, just adjusting something over here. All right. Well, thank you for that intro. I am excited to talk to y'all. Um, my name is Megan. I'm in Denver, Colorado. If you would like to follow my blog, you can look up datasavvy.me. I'm on Twitter a lot. It's like 50% data stuff, maybe 30% dog stuff, and then a little bit of other. Um, I'm also one of the organizers for Workout Wednesday, and I'm going to take just one minute to talk about that because I think it's a, a really worthwhile um, effort. It started on the Tableau side, but now for 2021, it's been going for Power BI as well. So we have a challenge every single week and some months we have a theme and sometimes we just do whatever but we give you let me click on mine um requirements and an example dashboard and you figure out how to make something similar so this was the last one i did where you could put in a distance um, radius and find all the locations from the all the coffee locations within that radius from the selected city. So sometimes it's DAX related, sometimes it's got a little power query in it, but it's always got some visualization stuff. So if you haven't tried to work out Wednesday, I hope you will join us. You can do any week at any time. Um, that's just workout-wednesday.com. Thank you for letting me spend a couple minutes on that. So I would like to start out talking about what are the elements of a story? In general, in my opinion, there seem to be five important components of a story. So first, we have context. Um, we need to set the stage, explain the environment, the surroundings, any necessary backstory. And I'm saying story in the very general sense, both data viz related and not. So after context, we have characters. That's the individuals who the story is about. And there's usually a main character who determines how the plot will develop. The next is problems or conflict. The plot of the story is centered on how this conflict occurs and how the characters attempt to resolve the problem. And people love a good conflict. Um, that's a lot of why we watch TV shows. And if we have problems, we have to have solutions. We get invested in those uh, problems and we need to know how everything turns out for the characters. And our fifth element is emotion. Will Storr said, a story is a description of something happening that contains some form of sensation or drama. It is, in other words, a an explanation of cause and effect that is soaked in emotion. It's this emotion that's crucial to the story. They make you feel, and that feeling is what causes you to remember the story and potentially act on its lessons. 
And that is often our goal with data visualization, be memorable and cause people to take an action or make a decision. So in addition to those familiar elements, stories have a recognizable structure. And it often takes the form we see here with a beginning, a middle and an end. You might also recognize this as situation, conflict and resolution. And at the beginning, we introduce our context, our setting, as well as our characters. And then we introduce the conflict and build it up to a climax before we come to the resolution where the conflict is solved and we all live happily ever after, at least in some stories. But another common structure for a story, especially in data storytelling, is this using the middle of the story to explain what could be and then contrasting that with how things currently are. I'll give you an example. When I was in college, I studied international business with minors in computer science and Spanish and Latin American studies. And I did my study abroad in Viña del Mar, Chile. And I always kind of wanted to live in Central or South America for a while. But life took other interesting twists and I currently live in Denver but sometimes I think about what could be. And one of my favorite animals is the capybara. I don't know if you're all familiar with those. They mostly live in South America. They are these large rodents related to guinea pigs and chinchillas, but they can be four feet long and two feet tall, but they're very social. And there's this whole subreddit for any of you Redditors out there called Critters on Capybaras where you can see all kinds of animals hanging out with capybaras. So I dream of a farm in South America where I can raise capybaras, but right now I live in Denver and raise a cranky bulldog. I would live in a hut and enjoy being close to nature, but right now I own a townhome in Denver that requires cleaning and maintenance and a nice big mortgage payment. And capybaras are so chill and social but life in Denver is full of stress and I barely know my neighbors. So as soon as we get through this pandemic, I should sell my house, move to South America and start a capybara farm. And then I could live free of super expensive housing, spend more time outdoors and be less stressed. And of course, just be friends with a capybara. So that's our story structure. We started with what's going on, um, my life in Denver, and then what if I could hang out with a capybara? You know, I've got a giant mortgage payment. I could live in a much simpler house and spend more time outside. So we have this, here's what it could be. And then at the end, the here's what I should do is the call to action. So storytelling is a big and in my opinion, overused term when we talk about data visualization but I wanna talk about why we care so much. And the first and possibly most important thing is that stories have a logical structure. We present background and characters, conflict, and then a resolution. So you get the information you need and then move to the next step in the story. It's easy to follow. Every culture has stories. We're familiar with how they go. Young children can make up stories. And stories are also engaging. So we get wrapped up in a story because we love a good conflict and it's satisfying to see the resolution. That emotion that I mentioned earlier gets us all interested and engaged in that story. And it also makes it memorable. Um, there are probably some stories from your childhood that you still remember to this day. I can tell you the story of the three little pigs, even though I haven't read it or heard it in years. We want our data visualization to be sticky like that if we can help it. It helps us be memorable and to make an impact. But I am here to tell you that not everything is a story. There are a couple really good blog posts about this, and one of them comes from John Schwabish at PolicyViz. And he says that while many of us make use of that word story over and over again as we make our graphs, 
we need to be more careful with the word and only use it when it's appropriate, when we're getting people to feel deeply and when we're leading them to a meaningful climax. I don't know about you, but my last sales report is not getting people to feel deeply. Um, there's a good article. Nightingale is part of the Dating Vi Data Visualization Society. And um, uh, one of the guys, Joshua Smith, who won a, a Tableau contest, uh, it was the Tableau Iron Viz 2019 competition. He went back and he wrote about it and he got scored really highly on story. And he went back and said, you know, my data visualization wasn't really a story, but that's okay because it's important to highlight that a visualization isn't more or less powerful, beautiful, or important just because it does or doesn't tell a story. So if we can agree that not all data visualization is a story, then we can kind of see it as a spectrum. On one side, you have annotations, and they are simply just well-organized, have a logical order, but there's no real emotion to them. So on the far side, the story is the kind that has the plot with the emotional engagement and the conflict and the characters for people to get attached to. In between annotation and story is narration. And this is where we describe what's going on and we frame our reader's journey. So maybe there isn't a true conflict or emotions, and that's okay. If you can get your Power BI report to story, that's great, but sometimes it's just not. But we have this tendency to do this very dry, sparse reporting, and it's barely an annotation. So moving your report further along the spectrum, it humanizes your topic and it makes it more relatable and memorable. So a lot of the time, what we're really aiming for is that happy medium of narration rather than story. So if you see people raving about storytelling and then you look at your reports and you feel a bit puzzled, you can let yourself off the hook because not everything is a true story and that's okay. Just because we don't necessarily have a story, though, it doesn't mean we get to just throw stuff on a page and call it good. We need things to be organized in a purposeful way. Uh, a while back on Twitter, there was a hashtag called explain a film plot, plot badly. And one of them, I think, is a really good illustration of this. So it was Lord of the Rings. And the description of the plot was group spends nine hours returning jewelry. Accurate? Yeah, pretty accurate. But it leaves out so, so much uh, that made the movie, you know, memorable, um, that really told the point, the message it was trying to get across. So we don't want our data viz to be group spends nine hours returning jewelry. We need to humanize it a little more than that, make it relatable. So let's talk about what do I do if I don't have a story and I just have a report with some annotation or narration. And the first thing I'll tell you is that no matter the amount of story that you have, you always have a message. So this is your key takeaway, the answer to the question, so what? And when you're designing, you need to define your message first for the entire report and what I mean by that is be able to tell me in one to two sentences why this report exists and what I should get out of it. And then as I add visuals, I need to be able to explain the visual and how it relates to my overall message. And if I can't explain how that visual relates to my report's message, maybe that visual doesn't belong in my report. And at this level, it's kind of a whiteboard exercise or a sticky note activity. Uh, the last time I taught an in-person um, pre-con full day um, session, I actually handed people sticky notes and had them do this. Um, you don't even have to choose your chart type yet. Don't even go that far. Just be able to articulate who is your intended audience, what idea you want to convey, which is your message, and then the questions you want to answer related to that topic. 
you can do this or should be able to do this for any report. Uh, let's take a look at a visualization that I think does a good job of this, of defining that message and purposefully designing to support that message. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. So this is about determining if a larger production budget means more Oscar nominations. And it turns out the answer is no. So we've got a nice descriptive paragraph and then our data visualization with number of Oscar nominations on the left and production budget on the right with the movie title down the center. So her message is clearly stated at the top. It's in the title and it states her conclusion right there. And then she has the nice explanatory text in the data biz and her chart clearly supports that message. Uh, everything on this page can be easily justified as supporting her message. Oh, sorry, I forgot I have click through here. Um, that's easy because it's static data. She already had her data analyzed and she could state her conclusion. But a lot of Power BI reports uh, are not static like that. They're dynamic. Their data is set to refresh on a schedule. So we can't know that sales are up for this quarter because the numbers are changing. So when that happens, we have to change how we approach the design. Whereas with explanatory data visualization, the report creator takes on most of the responsibility for telling a story or message. When we shift to exploratory, some of that effort goes to the report consumer. So we have a sort of vague plot without details of specific numbers. And um, we have to provide things like signals, which could be KPIs and gauges, to tell our report consumer how things are going. And we provide context. This is our background information, things the consumers need to create their own conclusions and build their own story. So this is probably much more in line with your typical Power BI report. And so you actually get to provide less of the story yourself and provide more of the structure for delivering this, the, the elements for someone to form their own story. And that is called story forming. Uh, a while back, I wrote a blog post about this and I didn't have a name for it, but I emailed Andy Kirk, um, who is visualizing data on Twitter. And I asked him, you know, what do you, how do you describe this? And he said, oh, that's story forming. So basically the change is just how you think about it. You don't know the answer to your question, but you do know the question you wanna answer. So instead of saying bicycle sales are up year over year, we might just know that we wanna show year over year sales by product category. And even with dynamic data, we can still go for a bit of story. Uh, in Power BI, this might mean DAX formulas to populate titles and text explanations using conditional formatting, that smart narrative feature, uh, or the enlightened data story custom visual. So it's as if we're telling the story, but the actual plot details are data driven. And we could also add in, you know, a bit of machine learning to help pick out important data points and trends. You can kind of take it from there. So let's look at an example that I made years ago at this point. That is story forming. So this is a report about the questions people ask on Stack Overflow related to Power BI. We can see that I have interactive controls with the slicer. I have signal with the cards and waffle charts. And then my table is also a signal because of the heat map formatting. And I have um, line charts to provide additional context. So this report organizes data in a logical order. First, you're looking at the Power BI questions on Stack Overflow, and I tell you there are 4,361 4, total questions asked by about 2,800 users. 
and those questions received 4,287 answers, which is about one answer per question. And most questions are answered within a day. So Power BI questions don't get a lot of upvotes or downvotes. Um, their question score is pretty close to zero. And we can read on and see that 77% of questions get answered, but users aren't very good about marking the answers as accepted. So if you're in it for the internet points and you're trying to help people, uh, the Power BI tag may not be where you want to spend your time. So then I can go and see how the number of questions has increased over time, and we can see that people go back and reference even older questions, and that the most popular topic is DAX by far. Um, so I deliberately set the context with those summary steps to help you know whether you want to use uh, Stack Overflow to learn about Power BI or ask questions when you're stuck. And once we got through the summary stats, I provided a bit more context, and then I showed you what topics have good participation. So it's not a full story, but it's more than just um, slapping things on a page and maybe even a bit more than annotation. And I'm actually gonna skip this demo today, but I'm gonna tell you where you can find it. If you haven't seen the smart narrative, go look on the Power BI blog um, in September of 2020 where they introduced it and they've got it shown there. It's basically conditional formatting for your text box. But I'm going to move on to conditional formatting for story forming and oh, open up a report, which I apparently just closed my apologies. Let's do it this way. You'll see that report in a second. There we go. We'll just open it from here. Sorry about that. While we're waiting on that to open, it doesn't look like there are any questions in the meeting chat. Anybody have questions so far? I realize this is kind of intro material. Uh, there is one question. Somebody wants to, can you share what are all the visuals used in the movie for BI report? The movie um, report is not made in Power BI. That was somebody, she's a freelancer that I met through the Data Visualization Society. All right, we've got this one open. And for some reason, I can't see that in the chat. So I'm gonna ask you to help me out next time I pause. Um, this is a report and I'll actually show you the original. This is a sample report that you used to be able to download in Power BI. I haven't checked lately, but it was kind of a mess. So I did a webinar with Rob Farley a while back and we each kind of made our own interpretation of what we would rather see. So where they had new hires, they've got like new hires, active year over year change, and then by region, I didn't feel, feel like it was very focused and told a good story. And they had a whole other tab. Sorry, I'm going to stop clicking around in a second for separations. And it didn't feel like it was focused enough for me to follow kind of a logical order. So I remade it, but I did a couple of things. This active employee count over time is actually, um, yes, it's just the title but it is conditional formatting. And so is this one. So when I look at it, it's referencing a field 
And what you'll notice if we look at this one, um, new hires have exceeded separations over time. Well, this is not static data. I could refresh it and it would change. What I did was I created, let's see, yep, a DAX measure. And mine's just a big switch statement to say I've got some other stuff that counts new hires and counts um, separations and subtracts them. So I'm looking at the sign, meaning is it positive or negative? And then just putting in some logic so that I can populate this title. So I did that for all of these. You know, gender diversity, it's looking at the percentage there, it's remained roughly the same over time. Turnover percent has remained roughly the same over time. So I'm using that to populate all my titles here. Um, you can do the same type of thing just by creating a DAX measure and then clicking on the FX thing and adding it there. So you don't have to have, and I left this one so that we could see it, just plain active employee count over time. You can be stating a conclusion even if you don't know your conclusion right now. So we're going to go back there. So we talked a little bit about um, not having a story, and that report I think had a little bit of narrative in it. But what do we do with our visuals on a page? How did I, why did I feel like my version told a better narrative? Well, here's where I learned a lot of this. There is a Microsoft publication, and it's actually from April 2016, uh, but I think it's still incredibly relevant today. So I'm going to switch back over. And it's called Emerging and Recurring Data-Driven Storytelling Techniques. And in fact, I can, oh, I can't send messages because I'm not a member of the chat. So this will all get uh, put out there with the video then. Um, this paper goes through and looks at techniques used by DataViz, not just Power BI, um, to tell a data-driven story, regardless of the data visualization tool used. And so you'll see they've, they've got some images of some examples in there. And um, I really like the paper because it's very practical and applied. So they have, the, they have identified four broad categories with some subcategories underneath of the techniques that people use to tell a narrative. So I'm going to take these four techniques, explain them, and then show you examples from that are referenced in the white paper and then show you my version in Power BI. So the first technique is called communicating narrative and explaining data. And all it is, is you intersperse your charts with text or video or audio narration. So it's a lot like a news article. And here's the one that they, that I have referenced in the slide. You see there's a bunch of text and then a chart and then some more text and then a chart, more text and a chart. And that's all it is. Um, you can do this in lots of ways in Power BI. And so I'll show you my version. And that was the report <laughs> that I had open earlier. I adopted a dog during the pandemic. Um, her name is Izzy. You may or may not have seen her lurking in the background. <laughs> she may come back. She's gone back to take a nap now. And I knew she was some kind of bulldog. They just listed her as bulldog mix at the shelter. And I had an English bulldog um, just before her that passed away from cancer and I was ready to get a new dog. So I saw her image on the animal shelter site and I went to meet her and adopted her. And she is definitely part bulldog, but she has long legs. I don't know if you hang out with English bulldogs much, but they're kind of short. So she's got that kind of bulldoggy face, but a little bit of a longer snout than an average English bulldog. So I thought maybe she was a bulldog boxer mix. And I sent Izzy's DNA to Embark Vet. If you didn't know, you can get your dog's DNA tested to figure out what kind of dog it may be. Um, 
as well as check for some potential health issues. And to my surprise, Izzy came back as 100% Old English Bulldog. And I can kind of see the resemblance here. That looks a bit like her. So an Old English Bulldog, um, the original Old English Bulldog actually faded out a couple hundred years ago, but they've been bringing it back since the 1970s because the English Bulldog has been bred uh, in such a way that it causes a lot of health problems and they only live to be about eight to 10 years old. So they're trying to breed the health and athleticism of what Bulldogs used to be back into the Bulldog today, but keep the super friendly temperament um, of an English Bulldog. So this is my report and you can see I have text. And in this case, the images are actually data visualization because it's telling you what she looks like, which is relevant to the story. And then more text and then images of the type of dogs I thought she were. So that is also data visualization, more text, data visualization, and then another data visualization. And I made this so that if I hover, you can see um, the breed foundation. So they're like half English Bulldog and then a mix of Bull Mastiff, American Pit Bull Terrier, and American Bulldog. But this is how I can see you doing this in, um, in Power BI. Just don't be afraid of putting more text on the page than you might normally. The second technique is called linking separated story elements. And you can do this through color, interactivity, animation, it's pretty easy to do with report themes and actions and buttons in Power BI. So I'll show you a, an example of how this was done in The Guardian. We'll make this a little bigger here. Um, this was talking about gay rights in the US and it's a pretty old article, but I like how they did the interactivity through color, so I still use it as an example. Um, here's and gay marriage is legal in the US in all states right now, although some of our states <laughs> are not quite believing that still. But they organize this by state, by region of our country. So Northwest, Southwest. So here's Colorado. And each color represents an aspect of gay rights. Um, red is marriage, yellow is hospital visitation, blue is adoption and so on. So you can see maybe in the Southeast, there are some rights that were not available. And if I go down, I'll notice those same colors used in this wheel are used down here. And they used the same um, region breakout with those same colors. So here's my hospital visitation rights and here's what it means. I can hover over each one. And so that's how they linked it was through color. Here's a report I made a couple years ago about my company, Denny Cherry and Associates Consulting. Um, I kind of made little columns of information related to each topic, and I did use color, but I also used interactivity. So if I wanted to see some fun facts about my team, I could just click through, but I did maintain the color theme for each topic. So if I click on experience and education, you know, I keep the blue and now I can see how long people have worked with SQL Server, Azure, Power BI, and so on. And I actually have a little guessing game in there. Um, but again, you can see, you can just click through and I keep the color. So that's how I implemented this linking separated story elements. It doesn't always have to be on the same page like that article. It could be on different pages. It could be on the same page. It doesn't really matter. You just keep one element the same that people will keep in their head um, as as matching the category that you're that you're relating across visuals. So uh, the third technique is. Enhancing structure and navigation. So this is the you know, previous next buttons, scrolly telling, 
breadcrumbs, menu selections, anything like that. And if you hear people talking about an app-like experience in Power BI, this is kind of what they're saying. You want to provide users um, navigation to let them choose and understand where they've gone in the path of understanding your report. So we're going to go look at this Bloomberg article first. And this is an example of scrolly telling. So as I scroll down, I'm going to make that a little bigger. The text changes and the visualization changes according to what's going on in the text. So Americans are uh, very addicted to their large trucks and they've got some stuff, you know, hover text and different things in here. It's not a, just static bubbles, but that's how they implemented the structure and navigation as you scroll down and you can choose how fast you want to go, uh, where you want to scroll to. You can do this in Power BI really simply, or you can go all out. So I'm going to show you just the simple version. Um, my city, Denver, I feel like is bad about traffic accidents. But I pulled the data for this in 2019, and it turns out you would think it's because it's very snowy here in the winter. Um, you would think it's because it's winter time, you know, bad weather. But it turns out that accidents don't happen most during bad weather. Um, they happen on Fridays and they happen in the spring and the autumn more than winter. So it's kind of uh, telling you, you know, a different story than what you might expect. They happen on dry roads in daylight <laughs> in the afternoons on busy streets. So I kind of introduced this topic here and I start you out on analysis by time. And then you can click and go to location. And so then I tell you about which locations tend to have um, the most accidents in Denver. And I have a little thing to let you choose. Maybe I want to look at Capitol Hill. And there's a lot of stuff going on in there. And so once I get done with that, I have driving conditions. What kind of conditions on the road and the environment happen um, to cause are, are present when accidents occur? And we can see again, it's daylight, it's dry, it's on a level street. It's mostly because people are following too closely and driving carelessly. They're on their phones, whatever. Um, my car, my last car got totaled because somebody ran into the back of it going 60 miles an hour. So as an anecdote, my uh, experience matches what this data says too. But all I did to do this was add buttons and some formatting so that you would know which um, page you are on. And this could be done with page navigation or it could be done by switching out, you know, just the visuals, doing one page with visibility changing to show what's in here. There are performance implications to both, just explaining that you can go either or. But this is our enhanced navigation. And that's really, you know, the simplest version. I have seen scrolly telling reports in Power BI. I think they are very difficult to do because everything loads on one page and uh, that can cause like a 20 second load time when you're very first interacting with it. But I've seen someone, um, if you go look in the data stories gallery that had a few that the uh, performance was actually okay. So scrolly telling is just that scrolling down. Um, providing controlled exploration is our last technique. So we have dynamic queries that allow users to make selections. This is our ad hoc exploration. Um, usually we try to constrain it. You don't just let someone go crazy and go, here's your data model, put whatever you want on there. It's more of a, let me make a few choices within a report. And sometimes that is all they provide, or sometimes there's a, a long report and then a separate exploratory piece. And we actually saw one of those on the Bloomberg graphics. So when you get to the bottom, you get to choose what you want to see. 
So I could do that. I drive a Mazda CX-5. I could look for my car. You know, whatever you want to do here, that's kind of the controlled exploration because I can only change group by, color by, and what car I want to look at. Another example of that is this Oscars uh, 2015 article from The Guardian. So does winning best director kill your career? And you go through and they have, you know, a little bit of text and explanation, and then they have down at the bottom, explore your data. So here I can choose whether or not to show the IMDB rating. I can um, search for a specific director, if I can spell today. There we go. I can hover over stuff to get more information. So that's that separate um, controlled exploration. I'll show you my version. This is kind of a template I made to help some of my clients that have um, like multi-tenant situations where it's one customer per database. And so I have a bunch of uh, summary stats on the left and some information, but if I click on data storage, There we go. Users can kind of choose what they want to see. So based on the server, different metric names from Azure are provided. So I'm looking at storage percent right now. Maybe I want to switch to CPU percent or CPU used. So I can only change what server and database I'm looking at, the metric I'm looking at, and then what aggregation, whether I want it to be account, min, or max, and the dates. I can't do anything, but I've given them options of what they can change. All right, we're coming to the end. So those were our four categories of applied storytelling. Um, the reason we like stories is because they're engaging and memorable, and that's something we need our data visualizations to be in order to actually reach people and have them engage and understand the data we're presenting. Not everything is a story, and that's okay. If you feel like your report isn't a story, that's fine. Just think about annotation or narration and see if you can't make your report more relatable through adding more context or having more data-driven labels to help tell a story or create a conclusion. In the end, most reports can be humanized a little more. And so you wanna try to push it towards narration if you're kind of sitting at annotation. And regardless of if you have a true story, you can use what Microsoft called the storytelling techniques in their research paper. So we had communicating narrative and explaining data that was interspersing your charts in between text or audio, linking separate story elements. We saw the Guardian article where they linked via color, and we saw my report about my company where we linked both via color and interactivity where I could click to go to another page with more information. Um, we have enhancing structure and navigation. That was our app-like experience, the buttons to let someone um, go through the report in a order that I've designed. And then we have providing controlled exploration, and that was that database management demo where they can change a few things to get a different story. That was our choose a server, choose a metric type of thing, but not just a complete free-for-all. So that is the end of my content, but I am apparently not a member of the chat, so I don't, I can't see if there are questions. Um, we got four questions. I'm interested why you're not a member of the chat. Let me see if there is anything I could do. Um, yeah, 
James is there, so. Yeah, I, can, I am here. I can. Well, we can read them out for you, I guess, Megan. Prathi, your microphone is still very buzzy. <laughs> okay, you do it. Okay. Um, Prathi summarised them in the chat, so I'm going to uh, grab those ones. So, um, I think we've answered the first one, which was the name of the visual in the marriage port. Was that the one that wasn't a Power BI report? Correct. So the next one is Aziz's after, um, if you're able to share a link to some of the Power BI reports that you've been um, demoing. Yep. Um, my slides are actually on my website too. And so if you want any of that, you can go to Data Savvy. Ah, oh, brilliant. And um, Vincent, thank you for that, for pasting the link up in the chat for everybody. Yes, thank you. Great. Um, next question then is um, on your um, Denver accidents report, you used a waffle chart, um, mm -hmm. which, which uh, I guess it's a custom visual, which, which waffle chart custom visual did you use? Yeah, that one in the bottom left. Yeah. That is just waffle chart. Waffle chart. <laughs> awesome. Um, we'll see if we can dig that out and uh, find a link to put in the chat window. There is a, um, I don't know if it's the same one, but there was a waffle chart released many moons ago. Let me see if it's still there. Yeah, that one is very old. So there's, yeah, there's three currently in the uh, custom visuals market, or two in the custom visuals marketplace. There's the original waffle chart, and then there's the enlightened waffle chart. You know, um, I've used Enlighten, um, and I think that might be the one that I used on the um, Stack Overflow report. And the difference for me is the big text next to it and how I'm a big accessibility nerd. And when you see the table that gets created behind the waffle charts, I remember not liking this one as much because it doesn't actually say 93% um, to someone who can't see the visual. That makes sense. But thank you for that. I'm just having a look if there's any more questions. Um, Bettina asks, really interested to see the Azure DB metrics. Is that report cross tenant? Um, that report is not published anywhere that's publicly accessible. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think I think that might be all the questions. There are lots of people saying thank you very much and um, particularly like uh, the question from S. Payne saying um, just how much it's made them realise how uncontrolled the experience is for their users, given them a lot of inspiration. And thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, I think that's it. Have I missed any others, Prathi? I'm trying to scroll through the text, but I think that's all of them. No, that's all. I'm trying not to go on mic. <laughs> yes, <it is. laughs> I have to get that fixed. This is what happens when you uh, you trial out your fancy new uh, microphone setup on the user group for the first <laughs> time. <laughs> it does seem to be a day for uh, communications issues. So, well, yeah. I think that's it then, and we've managed to finish uh, remarkably uh, on time, which is great. Thank you very much, Megan. It was a uh, outstanding presentation really uh, some really good things in there that i am going to uh, take on board as well um so we have a small announcement about next month's user group to make so next month which will be december's user group will take place on the 7th of 
December, but it's not going to be a virtual online one. We're going to have a pause for that for December. And instead, um, for those of you based in uh, the UK, and particularly the Southeast, I hope this is quite exciting. We are going to be doing a in-person user group uh, in London, the first one since February 2020. Um, we're really grateful to our sponsors, Nigel Frank, who have uh, enabled us to uh, go back and use their office space in central London again. So we'll be hosting it back in our old uh, old venue of the Nigel Frank offices um, in the city of London. Uh, it will we will confirm all the details, but it will be on the 7th of December with Brian Maffer, who will be talking through his new Power BI uh, version control solution that uh, was announced a week or two ago. Um, I don't think I've missed anything there. Obviously, all of the details for that will be posted um, on our social media. And let me just very quickly share the link for those. Um, let me share my screen quickly so you can get those. Uh, we will obviously be advertising them on Meetup, LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, those are the links for uh, for those. Um, obviously, it'll be on Meetup. We'll also announce it on LinkedIn and Twitter. And the video from uh, Megan's session today will be posted up on our YouTube site. Uh, as I mentioned in the chat, I don't know if you saw earlier, I'm a little bit behind on posting the videos up. Hopefully, uh, over the next couple of weeks, I'll get back. I think we're missing about four, so I will I will get all of those posted up. We haven't lost any. We've got them. Um, I've just been a, a bit behind getting them posted up so that we will catch up. So I think that's it. Um, so uh, again, and, Megan, uh, thank you very much. Thank Sorry, you, Megan. Oh, and uh, ask me anything at the next one. Oh yeah, um, are we able to announce who that's with, Prathi? Yep, so uh, in addition to Brian's session um, at the London user group um, next month, we're also going to host a Ask Me Anything session. Um, Prathi and I obviously will both be there and we will be joined, very excited to announce, by two members of the Power BI uh, CAT team. Uh, we will have Casper de Jonga and Chris Webb. Uh, Obviously, two uh, long-standing uh, speakers for the uh, user group, and they will be there for our first uh, in-person session for the best part of two years with an Ask Me Anything session. So great. Hope to see you there. Worth mentioning, there will be a limit on numbers. We haven't quite got the exact amount of people we'll be allowed in the building, but it won't be as many as we would have had historically while we're still in um, COVID restrictions. So um, we, if you do want to join, please make sure that you sign up early. And if you then can't make it, please unregister yourself so that uh, we're able to free up more spaces for people who can go. But all details to be posted uh, in the next week or so. Great, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Megan, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.